Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for everyone who came for the second round of the course on expanders. All right, so as I mentioned, I have some new um, references so in particular. Today, you're going to talk a little bit about random walks, not much, which I think they are a very nice subject. And if you want to know more, I recommend this reference. It, uh, these are some lecture notes with our work in progress, and I found them very nice. Okay, so I will start with a little bit of a quick recap on what happened last time. So last time, uh, well, we said that G would be a finite graph, and we define the Chiga constant. Uh, yeah, was defined uh, as the minimum of the ratios of the size of the boundary of the set as you range, as you let all the sets range within the subset of the group of the, the graph. And then we define a sequence of expanded graphs as a sequence of finite graphs that gets larger and larger, a uniformly bounded degree, and satisfy a uniform lower bound on the Schieger constant. And this is a notion of isoperimetric inequality because it means that for every subset you pick that has less than half the total number of vertices, then its boundary is at least a seven times as large as the set. So it is a, it is a intrinsically geometric notion from, from this perspective. And, and it also is a notion saying that it is hard to disconnect these graphs. These are very highly connected. And as I mentioned at the end of the course, uh, of the last lecture, this course it will not be much about proving hard results, it's more about proving some neat results. I mean, proving some, actually proving some small results, which I think they have nice proofs and some nice ideas. And we started off last time by proving an application to error correcting codes, where the neat idea was that if you have a bipartite graph that is has a very good expansion properties, then it has the property that for every subset on the right, there exists a point on the left that has a unique neighbor. So for example, here you have this set A, and then if you look at this boundary on the side, you see that there are a couple of points that have a unique neighbor. So that then you can do a, a parity check to define you, I mean, to estimate the distance of the codes, which I think was very nice. But we are not going to talk about this anymore. Uh, this is the past. Today, we are going to explore the different notion of highly connectedness for graphs that I mentioned. I said that a graph can be highly connected in the sense that it's hard to disconnect it, or in the sense that it is easy to walk around. And this is what we're going to focus on today. And by the end, we will provide some constructions of some constructions of expanders. So let me begin a quest to find the explicit constructions of expanders. So the problem is that it is very hard to estimate the Chiga constant of a graph because you need some way to manage all the possible subsets in, at the same time, which is complicated. And one solution is to is that there exists a spectral criterion, uh, a spectral estimate. Spectral. For it. And this is what we are going to talk about today, is the spectral estimate of the Chiger constant. And so uh, to simplify the discussion, we will only work with regular graph. graphs. Only work with the regular graphs. And but let me remark that everything that I say can be done more in general. Everything that I say today will have an analog that will holds for non-regular graphs. It's just that going into that requires a little bit of extra notation and there are some sub, well, not subtleties. There are a few more extra details that I prefer avoiding. So we will just restrict to the regular graph instead. 
And the tool that we need are averaging operators. So we have we fix a regular graph G, and then we can consider the vector space. The vector space of functions from the vertices of the graph to the real numbers. And this I denote by R to the G. That is uh, just associate to every vertex a number. And the definition is that the averaging operator is denoted by A of G for today. And it is an operator from this vector subspace vector space onto itself. Uh, which we just denoted by A, if G is clear from the context. Um, okay, so, yes, and uh, we define it as follow. So this sends a function F to a different function A of F, and A of F is defined so that A of F of the vertex D is equal to the average of the values of f in at the neighbors of d. So it's, since it's an average, it's going to be one over d, where d is the degree of the graph, and then sum over all the edges connecting b to something of f of the endpoint. So let me point out that here I actually am counting uh, edges starting at D, so in a sense, these are oriented. But we can ignore that. So, uh, for example, with this graph here, when we want to compute A of F of B, then we need to pick the sum, well, of F W1 plus F W2 going off that way, and then FW2 again, where this time I'm going up this way, and then there's FW3. This is it. While in this case here, the sum that I'm considering is well, F of W, and I thought only one way to get there. And then there is F of V, because V is connected by an edge to itself. And then there's F of V again, because I can also go the other way around. So these are the sums, the averages that we're considering. Okay. Um, the nice remark is that this operator actually describes a simple random walk on the graph, where the simple random walk, we will use a, an informal definition. We start at the vertex. B not, and then st you start walking on the graph. So get the sequence B not, B1, B2, etc., where the k vertex, well, the k, k plus one vertex, k plus one vertex, is chosen uniformly at random among the neighbors of the teeth vertex. Okay. Better. Okay. So, so uh, there is a question in the chat. Which I ask, which which I actually meant to ask the same question. So, so is f here just? Are you just defining the average in general, or f is a, a specific function that you? Uh, averages in general. And okay. okay so I, will, I will study how the averages behave on function. That is, I am. We are interested in the. So this is an operator on the space of function from space of function to the space of functions, and we want to see how this operator 
changes the function as you iterate. Right, right. Yeah, but 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 for this definition, this is the question that you have. For this definition, this is just uh, this is just here, an abstract app. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Any okay. app. So yeah, the notation a f of b means that so like it should be a f to mean like the function that is the image of f applied to the point p. Uh, yes, I, I was short in parentheses, but in the following, when I write a of f, I actually mean it's yeah, is the function a of f. And then evaluated at various points. So if you want to add all the parentheses, that's the way. Uh, thank you for the question. Okay, so back to our picture and our cartoon of random walk. So we start at a vertex P0, and then we pick one vertex at random, and we say this one is P1 among the neighbors, and then we walk at random again into P2, and then we walk again. Maybe we go backwards, so we get to P3, which is equal to P1, and then walk. Or etc. 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 So this is our random walk. And um, but now let us be a little bit more precise. The random walk let us define naturally some functions. That is, we have a function f0 that evaluated at the vertex w, it just gives you the probability that your starting point is equal to w. And then we have f of one is the probability that after one step, so v1 is equal to w. And again, f2 of w is equal to the probability that the second step is equal to w, and so on. So f of t is equal to the probability that at the t step you will be at that vertex. So let us start writing it up on this graph. So f of zero will give probability one to the vertex, to the initial vertex, and probability zero everywhere else. So this is the random walk. And now we can compute f of one. So we start at v0 and then we jump with half the probability here and half the probability we are here. And we are sure that they're not going to be anywhere else. So this is f of one. And now we try to see where we can end up at the second step. So if we were starting from this vertex, then we have two options. So either we jump down, and so we have probability one quarter to end up here because we have probability one half, one half to be there and then the half probability you go down and the other half you go here. So you're spreading your half probability a bit down and a bit to the right. And from these other vertex, the situation is similar. We have half the probability to go there, which gives you another one quarter and then half the probability to be here, which gives you one quarter plus one quarter is equal to one half. And then you will not be anywhere else. So you will, oh, so you will not be here, you will not be here, and you will not be here. And yeah, zero, and etc. And what I want you to remark at this point is that if we see like one half of P naught is the average of its neighbors, like uh, one half here, one half here, and then you get probability one half, and the same here, like the average of the average of the neighbors of f one at this point are a half of a half and zero, so you get a quarter. Basically, the bottom line that I'm trying to get is that the function f of t will be just equal to the averaging operator applied to the function f of t minus one. Or by induction, then we get that this is equal to the averaging operator applied t times to the function f of naught, f naught, which is the very easy function. And this is the precise sense in which the averaging operator describes the random walks. It, it gives the, the probability distribution of the t level of the random walk. Okay. And um, this is 
nice. And now, so this was the first remark about the averaging operator. And now we start with a few extra remarks. And one is remark is that the averaging operator is actually equal to one over D of the adjacency matrix of the graph. Where the adjacency matrix is the n times n matrix, where n is equal to the number of vertices of G. And it has at the ij coordinate, it has the number of edges from i to j. So we have a typical example of graph. This will give us an adjacency matrix. It will be a four by four matrix. And on the third row, on the third column, there are the neighbors of the vertex one, which is not connected to itself. And there are two vertices going to two, and one vertex going to three, and no vertices going to four. And then there is the vertex two that has, that is, two vertices, two edges going to one, and it is not connected to itself. It has one edge going to three, and it is not connected to four. And then there is the vertex three that has one vertex going to two, one vertex going to one, not connected to itself, one vertex going to four. And finally, there is four that has one vertex going to three. And it is connected to itself. And this comes twice because you go one way and then the other. OK, so this would be the adjacency matrix of this graph. And important remark that the adjacency matrix is symmetric. You can see here. And uh, in particular, what we know about symmetric matrices is that it is diagonalizable. And has real eigenvalues. And we can order those eigenvalues. So we say that lambda one is the largest eigenvalue, and then there's lambda two, etc., 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 all the way to lambda n. It would be n eigenvalues with multiplicity. Okay. Um, okay, what comes next? Yes. The remark is that now note that since A is an average, then it is easy to check that the largest eigenvalue is at most one. If you're just taking the average of things, you cannot increase the norm of the vectors. Um, moreover, A fixes the constant functions. And therefore, we deduce that lambda 1 is equal to 1. And now, as an easy exercise, that is, is one of the exercises. Oh, by the way, I sent to the organizers the list of exercises for this mini course. so you. You can probably find them on the website. Okay, and the easy exercise is that G is connected if and only if the second largest eigenvalue is strictly smaller than one. Okay. And we already get a corollary is that it is if G is connected, then the random walk a simple random walk converges exponentially fast to the uniform measure well, to be equidistributed. Well, equi this three two uh, what I mean by this uh, is that you have your you look at your operator a and you apply it many times a t of the function f not so let's say this a two t um, and we look at the distance between the function we get from the uniformly equidistributed probability 
and we look at the norm of this distance, where this is the L2 norm, that is just the sum of the squares of these values. And this thing is just smaller or equal than lambda 2, the 2t. Two and so this one goes to zero exponentially fast, where the exponent depends on, I mean, the speed of convergence depends on lambda 2. Um, yeah. Oh, yes, there is a remark. Um, you might be slightly bothered by this factor two that appears here, two t, two t instead of just t. And this is just to take care of biparted graphs. Because if you have a biparted graph, then minus one will be an eigenvalue. So that if you just iterate a, minus a many times, then all these smaller eigenvalues will flatten to zero. And then there remains the minus one eigenvalue that kind of flips up and down. And so it does not converge to being equidistributed. And so to take care of this, you just apply the, the random walk twice. Because if you, if you walk twice, yeah, if you walk twice, then you don't have, OK, you have a different kind of issue. But anyway, if you walk twice, all the eigenvalues will be positive. I mean, you are squaring all the eigenvalues. So you don't care about the negative spectrum. And the one that is important afterward is just number two. More or less. Yeah. Okay. So the takeaway is that uh, the rate of exponential convergence to equidistribution is a notion of connectedness. So this is the thing that I have been bubbling about for a while that the other way of seeing defining connectedness in terms of it's easy to walk around. You can see it as if you start walking at random how long it will take before you are completely lost and every place is every likely for you. And this will allow us to give a spectral characterization of expansion. That is, if we have a sequence of irregular graphs with uh, increasing cardinalities, and we let AG and you know, the averaging operators, and we let lambda 2 of AGN be the second largest eigenvalue, then it is a theorem that. Uh, Gn is a family of expanders if and only if there exists some positive constant delta such that uh, lambda second largest eigenvalue, so lambda 2 of a g n is bounded away from 1. So it is more or equal than 1 minus delta. That is, if you have a uniform control on how the second largest eigenvalue is bounded away from being one, then you have a uniform control on how well connected are those graphs. And so this theorem is telling you that this notion of well connectedness is equivalent to the notion in terms of Chiga constants. Uh, Federico, there was, there was a question about whether the eigenvalues of A are all positive. Is that? Uh, okay, uh, a priori no, and that that is that was the reason why I'm taking this factor two, because when I take the factor two, then I basically if I the the eigenvalues of a square, so I can I can values of the square of a matrix are uh, equal to the squares of I can values of a. I mean, just diagonalize it and then multiply it, and you have a statement. Uh, so when you have this statement, th this is why we take the factor two. So that then we only have positive eigenvalues, and we can indeed do this thing. Uh, but yes, you're not particularly worried about that. Um, OK, so we have our spectral characterization of expansion. And I have a couple of remarks to make. So the first remark 
which some of you will find interesting and the others should not care, is that there is an analogous of this theorem for infinite graphs. And this analogous is just telling you that the infinite graph is non-amenable if and only if the spectral radius of the simple random walk is strictly less than one. And this is Keston characterization of um, non-amenability. So you can see this theorem as the planetary version of Keston's theorem. And also the proof is quite similar. So if you, so if you know the proof of Keston's theorem, then you can adapt it to prove this other theorem. And the second remark uh, is that this theorem is usually used, is usually proved using edge expansion. And at some point yesterday, someone had a question whether I was looking at vertex boundary or edge boundary. And yes, I said that both are valid choices and we are using vertex boundary, but often the edge boundary is used. And in particular, the standard proof of this theorem uses the edge boundary, where the edge boundary is the number of edges leaving a set. And then you can define an edge Schickert constant precisely the same way where you just use the edge boundary instead of the vertex boundary. And then this, the theorem have become slightly more pleasing to state because then you have some very explicit estimates. That is, you can estimate a spectral gap in terms of this. I mean, you have these estimates in terms of the sugar constants, and yeah. sugar constants. And so actually, we can also use these estimates to produce some bound using the vertex sugar constant because it's very easy to check that since we have graphs of degree at most d, then the edge Jigger constant and the vertex Jigger constants are linearly bounded each other in terms of the sums. So Federico, we have a couple of questions. Uh, okay. One of them is, do you need to check proximity to minus one in the theorem? Um, uh, no, uh, depending on the definition of expanders, but, uh, um, oh, yeah, maybe. I am not completely sure. I think you do not need. Uh, because if you have some eigenvalues that is very close to being minus one, then you should also have some eigenvalues that is very close to be one. And so mm -hmm. you can probably ignore this. Yeah. Um, okay. And this other statement, the one for edge sugar constant, this one is, is too high. Okay, so, yes. so we have- uh, So yes, two... the, the, the question is, you don't need to worry about that. Okay, so we have two more questions. One is, uh, is there an analogous result for die graphs? Okay, I'm not sure what he, ah, die graphs, I mean, oriented graphs. Uh, probably, um, in some sense. Uh, okay, to the point is that to, to make that thing more precise, I think that what you want to do, okay, the proof I know for this theorem is by using random walks. Um, so as I said, it's the same as, it's similar to Keston's proof of um, the characterization of non-amenability non in terms of the spectral gap of random walks. And the setting of random walks naturally extends to D graph. That is, if you have a digraph, D graph, digraph, D graph, direct, D graph, digraph. If you have a digraph, then you can, I mean, yeah, you can do the random walk where you choose at random among the oriented edges. Like you, you can only follow your edges. And then, no, okay, no, I, I take it back. So you can do the random walk, but the proof will probably break because the proof utilizes utilizes a fair amount of symmetry. Like it, it utilizes that the random walk is reversible, which is precisely what is not a digraph. And so the proof works for reversible random walks. A digraph is not like the random walk on the digraph is not reversible, so this proof doesn't work. And the answer is that I do not know if there is a, an analogous theorem for digraphs. 
And were there other questions? Uh, okay. I think that's all. The others has been answered. Wait, I have a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so the the uh, usual, uh, I mean, spectral characterization of expansion that I've seen uh, uh, uses, uh, I mean, some eigenvalue that's bounded away from zero. What operator is that? <laughs> am, am I? Uh, that is one minus the average operator. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. So this is <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, okay. yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's uh, uh, and if you use that operator, then that also takes care of those annoying minus negative eigenvalues because that one has spectrum between zero and two, and the gap around zero is just given by lambda two. Thanks. All right, that's a good question. So let me just maybe what does the remark open one sees Laplacian, which is defined as identity minus. Averaging operator. So if you want the Laplacian of the graph, and um, yeah, okay. Then if there are no more questions, then we will do we will restrict to some special subclass of graphs that we should probably all know, and that is that we have a finely generated group. Then we can define a Cayley graph. Surprise, surprise, which is a graph, well, uh, denoted by a Cayley graph of gamma with respect to S, and it's a graph whose vertex set is gamma, and it has edges of the form gamma is connected to gamma S, where S is an element in the generating set. So classical picture, Z is generated by one, gives you the line, while if you want Z, uh, z generated by plus minus one, then it will add a bunch of extra edges that are going the opposite way. These are the edges given by minus one. And so you get a different graph. The other hand, so far, so good. But the graphs that we care about are actually, well, are related, but they're slightly different. They are the schreier cosset graphs. So given a subgroup of gamma, then we define the Schreier, Schreier concept graph um, is has vertices, but we denote it by sh of gamma, h, and s, and it has vertices. We want one correspondence with cosets that are right cosets of the graph. Uh, oh, let's just say hg, h gamma, we're coming in gamma. And edges are things of this form. h gamma is close to h gamma s, where s is one of the generators. Okay. So it's a shy closet graphs. Um, We have an example. So we pick a free group, F2, generated by A and B. And then as a finite in the subgroup, we pick one has a generated by A square, B square, and then conjugate of A and the conjugate of B. And we can look at the associated Schreier graph and I'll tell you that. This graph, a, this subgroup H has index three, so we have three vertices in the Schreier graph, and we start filling in the edges. So, well, we have red edges that denote A. So, if you start H, you have one edge, one red edge that goes to H A, and then if you go with A again from here, you will do. Yeah, since A square is an H, you go back. And why you start from HB and you do A, then you end up where you started. And similarly, if you start from H and you multiply by B, you go to HB. And then if you multiply by B again, then you go back to H. And if you start from HA, then you go back to itself. Okay. Um, one remark is that if N is a normal subgroup, 
not that good. Gamma. Then, well, right corsets and left corsets are the same. So the right corset is equal to the left corset set wise. And one can actually check. I mean, it's easy to see that the Schreier corset graph is just equal to the KD graph of the portion. Which again, n. Well, uh, yeah, S bar, right, S bar, let me phi of S, where phi is the projection from gamma to the portion. Okay, the important feature for us is that the Schreier coset graphs are, so, Schreier coset graphs are naturally directed and label, they're labeled and directed. That is, it's just like in this picture here, each edge is not just one edge, but it's an edge that is attached to a generator. So it has a label and it has a direction that is telling you which way that generator is moving your corset. And this will be useful later. And now as a smaller side, which is not important, but it's an interesting fact, is that the Schreier graph is homogeneous in the sense that for any two elements, there is a graph automorphism that sends one to the other and preserves the labeling. So it exists a graph morphism. So there exists a graph automorphism sending V to W preserve, preserving Labeling. Okay, so the graph is homogeneous if and only if the subgroup we we're starting with is normal in gamma. I mean, one direction is obvious and it, it follows from the remark because if n is normal, then it is a k graph and k graphs are very homogeneous. And this interesting fact is the opposite. And if you want, you can do it as an exercise. It was not in the exercise of the course, but it's interesting to know. Okay, anyway, back to us. The important feature is the labeling, as I was saying. And so, back to average operators, the labeling help us. So, first off, recall how we define the average operator. We have this A that applied to a function F gives you a function that applied to a vertex. And so, well, so let now G be a Schreier coset graph. Um, and know that this is 2s regular, I was saying, because you have s labels and each label goes with one direction. So you have 2s. So each vertex belongs to 2s edges. And okay, the other thing operator A applies the function f at the vertex h gamma, because vertices are cosets. This is defined as the average, so it is 1 over 2s of the sum over all the edges starting at V and ending at W of H of, well, let me, but H of H, okay, sorry. Vertices are H gamma and H gamma prime of F of H gamma prime. Okay, but the, we can use the labeling to rewrite this sum in a slightly more pleasant way. And so we get that this is one over two S, then the sum over the elements in the generating set and their inverses. Uh, so let me write S plus minus is equal to S disjoint union with S minus. And then we take f of h of gamma times t. That is, this is simplifying our life because this expression here depends on your gamma. That is, we have some finite sum that you understand well. It's like a finite sum over the generators and the inverses of something that depends on gamma. While a priori here, we will only have a less explicit 
condition. We will take like the sum to like we have we just move from a non-explicit condition to a very explicit one that we can work with more easily. Um, yes. And now we can, now that we have, now that we have rewritten the sum this way, we can reorganize it a bit. And to reorganize it a bit, we start with some remarks. So, okay. Note that for every fixed element in the group gamma, we get a bijection. from the set of posets onto itself, simply by sending the coset H gamma to the coset H gamma, gamma naught, which is multiply on the right. And well, small warning, this is not a graph map. So this is in the sense that it does not preserve the edges of the Shire graph, which is just some function on the set of vertices. Uh, but still, we do have this bijection. And what do we do with this bijection is that the bijection, it induces a transformation. It, a transformation on the set of functions. So on R the G to R to the G, remember G is a share graph, and it induces by this transformation by precomposition. That is, well, we call this transformation pi of gamma. And we have the pi of gamma applied to a function f. But this is a function, and if you apply it as some vertex h, well, it should be h gamma naught, pi of gamma naught applied to f is a function that applied to the cos of h of gamma is by definition f applied to the free composition by the bijection. So it is f of h of gamma times gamma naught. It's just a function. You do, you do the Precomposition, and then you, you see what the function is. And the important thing is that this is so pi is a linear representation. Of gamma is uh, on the vector space of function over G. Uh, moreover, it, it is an isometric representation that is it goes oh representation I should have written GL it's okay pi is a homomorphism from gamma inside the linear group of the vector space RG and what I'm saying is that it is isometric, that is, it is actually a an homomorphism inside the group of orthogonal matrices over R to the G. Okay. Uh, okay, so now we have this nice linear representation. And why do we like it? Uh, because the key point here is that our operator A of F that we just wrote it up here is, well, it's nothing but uh, one over two S sum over T in the generating, generating set and the inverses of pi of T of F. Yeah. So we rewrote our operator A as an average of unitary transformation of the Hilbert space. And what is the point of doing this is that now we can start using representation theory. So 
So if you want, we started off with a very difficult combinatoric geometric problem that is that was uh, approximated like trying to understand the Chigar constant of the graph, which we decided is very hard. And then by looking at the averaging operator and by messing around a little bit, we translated this problem to some problem into representation theory, which is algebra. And now algebra is a thing that people can prove theorems about. So it, it enables us to use a whole new set of techniques to try to estimate the Chiga constant and produce constructions. And so at this point, let me give you a new, an exercise. And it is that you should Google the definition of Kashyan property T. And then you should use your newfound knowledge to prove that if gamma is a group with property T, then you choose any sequence of finite index subgroups um, that becomes smaller and smaller. Then the Schreier graphs, which are finite graphs, will automatically be a family of expanders. That is, property T will give you expanders for free. And I'm not giving you the definition of cash down property T because the, just looking at the definition is not very enlightening. So I do recommend you that you Google the definition and you use the definition to prove the second part of the exercise so that when you use the definition, then you also understand why the definition is useful. It's one of those definitions that just by looking at it, you would like, yes, and so what? And then, and then, and then instead, if you take the other approach, if you're looking at expander graphs and you're like, oh, I really need something that produces me expanders, how can I get it? And then you say, oh, I would really, really like, so I would really, really like to know something about these objects here, these, these estimates. Is there anything that relates to those estimates with, with those differences? And the answer is yes. Cartesian's property T is precisely telling you something about these kind of differences. And so it, it, it is giving you a reason to care about Cartesian property T from this perspective, and there are many more other reasons. It's a very important property that uh, you should know. Um, okay, so yeah, in fact, the hint is to use the definition of property T in terms of these differences, that is, the definition in terms of almost invariant vectors. Okay. Um, sorry can i can i just ask are you always guaranteed i mean so if if gamma is residually finite which i guess is, is the case for most property two groups that people think about uh, then, yes. then you are guaranteed such a sequence of finite index subgroups but is that always uh yeah or, or any such sequence if we do expand this you actually don't even need to be one container to another was that a question? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Basically, I'm saying that if you have a group, okay, you basically have a group and you start looking at it at the family of Schreier positive graphs. And a priori, there is no reason to believe that this graph should be expanded. And property P just happens to be a magic property that tells you that no matter what subgroups you pick, no matter what you've done, you're going to get expanded. Like, Carson property T is telling you a priori that anything you do to that group, the Schreier graphs you obtain will satisfy the spectral conditions you need. So it, it, it's kind of like a proof by magic, if you want. Um, yeah, it's like you're looking for something and then there is this other property that is telling you that, yes, yeah, so you can do whatever you want and you're going to get it. Just, just need to wish for it. Um, okay. One small remark is that the part B of the exercise that is showing that Cartesian property T implies expanders can also be done directly without actually looking at the spectrum. Without, so without estimating the second largest eigenvalue, you can just use Cartesian property T by hand to estimate the vertex trigger constant. Um, but there are other instances where you do need to study the second largest second value. And plus all that we've been talking so far is a very, it's a perspective that is good to know if you 
I mean, in general, it's, it's, it's a useful perspective. Um, expander graphs, you can, I mean, expander graphs are better work with from many different perspectives at the same time. So the more things you have in your toolbox, the better. And plus even aside from expander graphs, all that I'm saying today is very much related with random walks, which I am a very big fan of. I think random walks are a very, very cool piece of mathematics. And so even if what we've been saying so far was not strictly necessary to get to the part B of this exercise, which was the thing that we cared about, I still think it's it's a useful piece of knowledge, and that's why I wrote about this. But anyway, now an example is due. And the standard example of a group with property P is SLKC. So the simple linear group, not simple, uh, sim SL3Z has property P. So any of its Schreier graphs will give you a sequence of expander graphs. Uh, so yes, SL3R2 has probably P. Um, yes, um, no, same, yeah. And in particular, there is one natural sequence that one can consider. And it is note that you have quotients from SL3C to SL3 with coefficient in Z mod NZ, where this quotient map is just given by writing each coefficient in mod 3 or well, mod N. And this is a homomorphism that we call it by N. And then the Killy graphs of the quotients, so on the Schreier graphs, it's the same. Um, okay, Killy graph of. Yeah. Okay. Well, then in particular, so this is subjective. So the Killy graph SL3Z mod NC generated by the by N S is one example of our Schreier graphs. And so this sequence are expanders. Okay, um, so this time I went faster than last time, so I also have time for a little bit of a bonus construction. First off, are there any questions so far? Are there probably groups that have without any finite in the subgroups? I do not think so, but I do not know many groups. So I don't know. Good, uh, good question, but I don't know. Um, that is probably not, but I don't know. Anyway, okay, if there are no more questions, then we go for a bonus construction of expanders, which is more geometric. So this kind of code might like it better. And so now we pick just a two sphere and we choose a triangulation TN for the two sphere by many tiny little triangles where many means N, N little triangles. And then we also choose two rotations of the sphere. So we have one rotation A and one rotation B. Then Okay. Then we define a graph GN by picking the triangulation and then adding a bunch of extra edges where the extra edges are added as follow. For every, oops, for every vertex B in the triangulation, Add the following. Okay, so there's a picture we have G, and then we look at its image under A. It's going to be some vert, some point somewhere. So we get A of B. And we add an edge from here to all of these vertices on the triangle. So we add 
three edges here. And we do the same, the same for B. We look at the image of B and the B and say that it falls in the middle of one edge. Then we add these two vertices. We add edges to those two vertices. It doesn't really matter this choice. But anyway, and we do this for every vertex B so that we are adding a whole bunch of edges. So something like that. Oops. Adding some edges like this, and then some edges like this, from this one, etc. So we add a lot of edges that kind of look like your rotation. We are approximating the actions, if you want. Like if you keep drawing all the edges, it kind of looks like you're drawing the graph of the action. And but is that these graphs GN are expanders if and only if, uh, well, yeah, the group generated by A and B acts on S2 with a spectral gap, which I don't want to define, but is very similar to this spectrum. I mean, which is second largest second largest. Again, you have an averaging operator and you look at the spectrum of that operator and you see if that spectrum has a gap, where spectrum means set of eigenvalues. Um, okay, so this is part one. And then part two is that there exist rotations A and B such that we have a spectral gap. So, so I put that. That's spectral gap. And for example, you can also like, write some very explicitly, like pick a matrix one third, two square root, well, minus two square root two over three, two square root two over three, one third, one. This is your A, and your B will be the same, but around the same rotation, but around the different axis. So this one, one third minus two square root two over three, two square root two over three, one third. Okay, it is a theorem that, okay, there is a very big hard theorem due to Burkan and Kambur. That implies that a whole bunch of possible choices will give you spectral gap. And these two matrices are example of that kind. So, and so we can use this Burkan Kambur expansion machinery to show that this kind of construction will give you expanders. So, if you want the proof of one is soft mathematics, soft math, and that it is kind of like, yeah, it's so, like some. Functional analytic estimates, some measure theory, not, nothing very fancy, but this one is hard math. I mean, hard math, both in the sense that like the techniques are doing some estimates and also in the sense that it is a much harder theorem. So it's the, it's the soft part that is giving it an equivalence and then produce example that at some point you need to do some hard work. Um, and in this case, the hard work is done by Burkan Gambor, and then there's a whole bunch of people who work on uh, generic, generic Lie groups, compact Lie groups, and it's a very active area of research. And I think I would stop here. So we are one minute early. Uh, to take for the last time that I was late.